All right. So for all of you that are just joining us, we will get started in just a minute or two. We want to give um, everyone a couple extra minutes to go ahead and get, um, get situated and get logged in. And as soon as that happens, we will go ahead and get started. Yeah, we have six and six now. Yeah, it's pretty good. Well, let me mute myself. Right, so we basically are going for the first uh, like 20, 25 minutes uh, from my side and then uh, it's Q&A and just whatever. Uh, right, well, actually, I'll, I will go ahead and start. I've got some opening slides and then I'll turn it over to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, somebody would need to send PDF to all participants. That is already arranged for Jessica will take care of that. Uh-huh because you sent your, your slides to her, correct? Uh, through, Lu, through Luis, yeah, yeah, Lu, Lu, Luis forwarded that. Perfect, so yeah, they'll get everything. Because uh, this is an important way to skip some uh, top level stuff and uh, just can go to substance. Okay. I Let's go ahead and get started. Let me share my screen. Yeah, yeah it's everybody's here. So thank you all for joining us and congratulations on your admission to USC. I it we have a very competitive um, application process. So the fact that you have been admitted is really a um, sign of just how strong you are academically. I would also like to welcome you to the Trojan family. And of course, welcome to Southern California and the University of Southern California. Um, we are obviously in the business of engineering for a better world for, for everyone. Uh, here are some basic statistics on our program. Uh, we have about 6,300 graduate students. So that's about twice as many graduate students as we have undergraduate engineering students. We have uh, 17 full-time tenure track National Academy engineer, engineering members. Uh, we are currently ranked number 12 for graduate engineering programs, according to US News and World Report. We have 76,000 engineering alumni worldwide, uh, which is really important when it comes to things like networking. Uh, these are all people that you can reach out to uh, as part of your network. Um, on the research side, we have $213 million in annual research expenditures, uh, and we have 38 research centers, and we are a leader in funded research. Um, for those of you that are interested in some of the more entrepreneurial aspects or um, innov innovation, USC is really well placed because Los Angeles is a global hub for innovation. We also uh, are right next to what is commonly referred to as Silicon Beach, one of the fastest um, growing hubs for um, engineering innovation and um, and startups. Um, this map here over on the left kind of gives you an idea as to just how, how everything sits. So you can see um, SpaceX is listed here, though they actually in reality are a little bit further south. Um, one thing that isn't listed here that's really important for those of you that are here in astronautics is that JPL is right up here. Uh, about 30 minutes north of us. And we actually have a lot of our students um, do end up either inter doing internships or working for um, NASA JPL. 
And if any of you are international students, one thing to keep in mind is that because they are not associated with the military, NASA actually is one of the groups that our international students uh, can work for. Uh, speaking of, of companies and career opportunities, um, Southern California has got a lot of advantages. I mean, we have a very deep ecosystem of aerospace uh, talent suppliers, specialized service providers, and that's because aerospace has, has um, been in Los Angeles. In fact, Los Angeles has been a hub for the aerospace engineering uh, industry for many, many years. And that's kind of extended into, um, in, into the space technology sector as well. It's also an active defense sector. Uh, there's a lot of engineering prowess. Um, the culture here uh, embraces innovation, entrepreneurship, and risk-taking. And there is a highly skilled and specialized workforce um, that is here in Southern California. I, to give you an idea, I'm, Southern Cal is known for the Mars landing, uh, the rovers there, the space shuttle, the B-2 stealth bomber, uh, we've de developed GPS systems and we're the home or have been the home for entrepreneurs from Howard Hughes to Elon Musk. Oops. So some career opportunities, just kind of an idea as to some of the companies that hire or um, and, and do internships for our students. Uh, we're also the number one state uh, when it comes to employ employment of aerospace and astronautics engineers. Um, in general, we are one of the top, top paying cities for uh, engineers in general. The average uh, mean salary in California is $126,000 to $142,000 per year. Um, these are based on numbers from 2020, the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. Uh, you can actually see more of the companies that were associated with um, if you if you go down here to the URL. And just so you know, everyone will be receiving copies of the slides, so uh, you'll have access to all of these different URLs that that we talk about. We have a very diverse student body. I mean, this picture just kind of gives you a feel for you know just how how wide that is. Um, a couple years ago, our undergrad, our um, our freshman undergraduate engineering class um, reached gender parity, with fifty percent of our um, incoming freshmen being uh, women. We're still working on that at the graduate level, um, but we um, definitely it's something that we're proud of uh, that we do have as many women, both students and faculty members, um, as well as a lot of initiatives and stuff and things that are working towards improving um, the number of underrepresented underrepresented um, minorities in STEM. A lot of the things that you'll want to know about are things that can best be answered by current students. I know if you're curious about housing or what it's like. Um, being at USC or living in Los Angeles. Our, our graduate student ambassadors are a great resource. We have over 15 of them uh, and they basically, they're set up on a, on a system called Unibuddy. So you're able to communicate directly with them via chat. Uh, again, there is a um, URL and you can look at, at all of the different ambassadors and you know, please take advantage of this resource and reach out to them with your questions. Here are some URLs uh, for further exploration. Uh, you can take a virtual tour of campus. Obviously, if you are in the United States, especially if you're in Southern California, our um, Visit the Turby uh, event for newly admitted students is this Friday. Uh, it is not too late to register for that. So, um, you know, please, you know, consider coming, coming here for that event. It's a great opportunity to meet uh, current students, faculty and staff in person um, during that event. 
Uh, you can take a look at more student organizations and cultural communities. You can learn about student safety and our wellness resources. And then finally, if you're an international student, if you go to ois.usc.edu, uh, you can see what sort of uh, support we have for um, our international students. There's also a lot of good information there if you have concerns about um, how the I-20 and visa process works. So some housekeeping, fall deadlines. If you are an international student and you have not yet submitted your financial documentation, please make sure you do so by April 15th. That assures that we'll have enough time to process that and provide you with your uh, formal admission and statement of intent. And speaking of the statement of intent, the last day to submit that is May 1st. And um, that when you do that, you'll also be submitting your $500 commitment deposit. Um, please be aware that the commitment deposit is basically gonna be applied to your first semester's tuition. So it's not an additional cost. So the reason you wanna submit your statement of intent earlier, and this includes uh, submitting financial documentation earlier, is you get, once you do that, you get access to pre-orientation resources. You can join the Viterbi mentorship program. You can connect um, with your department through additional academic webinars. If you are a, uh, one of our distance students, one of our online students, you can set up your Dennett Viterbi profile. You can also explore housing options. If you have any questions or, you know, for example, if you're not sure how to register for our visit to Turby, um, you're welcome to contact us. Uh, we have an online form, which is the best way to reach us. And the information is right here. So um, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to um, our astronautics uh, department. Um, the instructor is the, the director of the master's program is Mike Grentman. He is the current program chair for or program director for the master's program. He is a past chair and was actually instrumental in, um, in setting up the astronautical engineering program and moving it out um, from being part of our aerospace uh, department. Uh, Mike, why don't you go ahead and take it away? All right, I'm unmuted, I think. Uh, good morning, everybody. So let's, um, I have a short presentation. Uh, we will skip some pages because they're at the top level and you all will get the PDF of that presentation. So it's uh, not an issue. We will concentrate uh, on, uh, on, uh, the basics on the substance. Let me get to sharing the screen. And uh, Ray, can you see my stuff? Yes, it looks fine. Uh huh. All right. So, so just a second. Let me. Okay. So it's a, it's again, as I said, we will skip certain things. Uh, I will briefly talk about the school, the department, uh, research areas, and then we will concentrate on the Master of Science program. It's a big program. One of the largest in the country is in the space engineering area. Uh, at the bottom of the agenda, and again, you will have this, uh, all the slides, so we will get all the URLs. There is a uh, a link to a publication PDF about the program rationale, uh, the history and why and what we are doing. On the left is Neil Armstrong, one of the graduates. It's uh, before our department was formed. It was long ago in 1960s. Uh, he got a degree from the School of Engineering. So now we have Neil blessing all the students on campus just standing there on the left. Uh, this is what uh, Ray talked about. I will skip it. We're a leading research university in Southern California with all the links, uh, industry and the international 
uh, reach. Uh, we have a very large number of uh, engineering alumni uh, and the number of grad students is about a factor of two larger than the number of undergrads. This is immediately an indication that the school is very heavy on the research. What does it mean for you, for students? For students, it means your instructors in the classes and the faculty that you are interacting with. These are the people who are on the cutting edge in advanced science and engineering. So they are not those who learn about science and engineering from the books written by other folks and just uh, telling it to you as the case in many undergraduate schools and in the high school. So this is a different uh, kind of um, uh, arrangement. So it's again, you are the top people who are publishing articles in the leading journals, writing books and all that. So the department was established relatively recently, 15 or now 17, 16 years ago in 2004. It was based on the specialization in space engineering that existed in the aerospace program at USC. In 2004, the university president, uh, seeing how the program grew dramatically and appealed uh, to space industry. And when I'm saying space industry now and later in this talk, I mean not only commercial companies like Boeing, Lockheed and others, but also government space research and development centers, which is a big part of aerospace. And so we were established in the 2004 formally. We offered a full set of degrees, Bachelor of Science, Master, PhD, Certificate. And our program on the master's level is the anchor from the department. And this, is, this program is among the largest in the country. I, a little bit later, I will tell you about statistics. So the link at the bottom, uh, provides a PDF with actually several publications uh, about the program, its history, focus, and how it's organized. Now, the department is relatively small. Uh, Full-time faculty is relatively small. So the faculty is shown on the left. Uh, and uh, one is emeritus, others are very active. So, and I'm uh, somewhere just right here on the left. So I'm in charge of the master's program. Professor Irvin is the department chair. We actually uh, were uh, changing um, the, this position for some time. So I was the founding chairman then again, and the, the, then, then stepped in and now he chairs the department. So I'm in charge of the master's program since the very beginning. On the right is our staff, uh, Luis, uh, who is in charge of our student services is uh, shown there and other staff members support other functions of the department. Uh, it's a financial administrative and uh, business management. So we are relatively small in terms of uh, full-time faculty, but what is a major strength of the department, and this is shown on the right, the specialized courses and the Master of Science, this is not an undergraduate program. This is a graduate program. That means courses advanced, specialized. So the instructors in the most specialized courses work full time in the industry and government centers. And Los Angeles is at the right place. We are at the center of the American space industry. So our instructors are coming from the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory, from the leading industrial companies, such as uh, Northrop Grumman, Boeing, Lockheed. Uh, also, we uh, have instructors from the Aerospace Corporation. This is a leading uh, government center in the Air Force, and now it belongs to the United States Space Force that was activated. So most of our graduate courses are taught by the highly qualified people who are active in today in industry and government in space, and they bring the latest approaches, processes, methodology, latest achievements of the science and engineering to our students. So we have, uh, as I said, four full-time faculty and more than basically two dozens uh, adjunct faculty and part-time 
instructors. So our faculty and our instructors, we do what typically is being done in leading research universities in the United States. We advance science and engineering. We publish articles in the peer-reviewed journals. We publish books. So some books of the instructors are shown here at the bottom of this page. So it's again, we are, we are a regular leading engineering school. Now, the areas of the research that are covered by our small number of the full-time faculty uh, is uh, astronautics, space environment, space science, space mission designs, propulsion, uh, uh, some advanced areas like computational physics and high performance computing. Our faculty served and is, and they are serving and is also served in the past on a number of missions by NASA, by other government agencies and are cooperated with industry. So some of the missions are listed here. Also, the department is a home of a few student projects or programs that actually attract students across the departmental lines, but our department is the home and leads these programs. And these are rocket propulsion lab and liquid propulsion lab. And there are also students engaged in the Space Engineering Center where there's building lunar lander and micro satellites. Actually, a few CubeSats is already flying built at uh, our, at, the, at this group. Now, Rocket Propulsion Lab concentrates primarily, stu it's a student group uh, overseen by faculty from the point of view of safety and helps with the fundraising and all that. But it's a rocket propulsion lab builds the solid propellant rockets and they launch every year one or two rockets. And uh, two years ago, there was uh, the, the, the first group in the world, student group that reached the so-called von Karman line. This is about uh, uh, 100 kilometers in altitude. Now, so you can immediately see that this is a very, a very powerful achievement. Now, this group attracts primarily undergrad students, but also some master students engage as well. Majority of master students get involved in the so-called liquid propulsion lab, which is also a student run and operated group with some faculty help and uh, assistance. And the Dean also strongly supports that. This group concentrates on building liquid rocket engines. And that means designing, building, and testing them. And the testing is always fun. As you know, the most fun happens when things go wrong and the big explosion and all that. <clears throat> so this group achieved, uh, developed several uh, very <clears throat> interesting uh, liquid rocket engines. And now it is uh, embarking uh, with some cooperation with Rocket Propulsion Lab, perhaps on building or on, <clears throat> on a rocket that will be propelled by liquid propellant agents, it's, uh, engines. It's uh, a lot of interesting things that are happening. Again, a very large number, several dozens of our master students are engaged in these propulsion laboratories. As I mentioned, our department is, uh, the master's program is one of the largest in the country. So on the left, is some statistics, undergrad uh, programs, masters and PhDs since the beginning of the department. So we awarded more than 700 master's degrees since the inception. The last couple of years, uh, several years, we award more than 55 degrees on average in the Master of Science. This is approximately 3% of the national master's degree in a very broad aerospace field. The national statistics does not distinguish between aeronautical, astronautical, and aerospace degrees. So because space engineering is uh, not the biggest part of aerospace. It's a substantial, but not uh, the dominating part of aerospace. So in the space engineering, our program is probably responsible for 10, 15, or maybe even 20% of national degrees in the Master of Science. So it's again, we're growing. And the reason, and when you see the growing number, it tells you something very important. You also see that the figure on the right is color coded blue, parts of the bars are students who study full-time and the yellow bars 
uh, students who study online, they work full time and take classes through the distance education network. I will talk about this a little bit more. So they, these students work in the biggest our companies, legacy companies like Boeing's, Lockheed's, NASA, JPL, Aerospace Corporation, government, and also in the smaller companies. Now, these students are supported in their studies by their companies, and they can choose any program in their country to attend, to enroll, to get their master's degrees. So they're hired as a Bachelor of Science, and then they go to study towards master's degree. Since they can choose any program in the country, they choose the not only the best, but also the most valuable for them to advance their careers. And as you can see, our program is growing with time. That means that we provide something of real value for practicing engineers and for incoming flow of Bachelor of Science graduates. So it's again, the program is just growing and uh, it's, uh, the growth is a clear indication that something of value that we provide. Now let's just uh, talk about um, uh, some details of the program. So our program is designed for those with Bachelor of Science degrees in Science and Engineering. Not necessarily with a Bachelor of Science degrees in Aerospace. So for those who want to be involved in space engineering and exploration of space, in operation of space vehicles, satellites, to be in space, to be in sp work in space establishment, government or industry. Now, the space industry is extremely broad in terms of engineering specialties that it requires. So the uh, chemical engineers, uh, mathematicians, um, industrial engineers, uh, aerospace engineers, uh, electrical engineers, uh, physicists, astronomers, a lot of different specialties are engaged in the space industry. So when the, the people want to work in this industry, if you come with say electrical engineering degree or mechanical engineering degree, you can work in the beginning successfully, but after a few years, you will see that your progress, your growth in the professional growth and the growth inside a company would be limited by a lack of specialized space education. And this is what our program does. We take students with a bachelor's degrees with any engineering and any science background, which science means physics, astronomy, mathematics, chemistry, and the all flavors of engineering. And from there, we will take you to the, a degree in astronautical engineering. So you will get exposure in addition to your background, whether it was in aerospace, mechanical, or whatever it was, we will bring you to the level of advanced degree in space engineering. So this is an, why we are so valued by the practicing engineers from industry who work full time and who come to us to get the master's degree, because again, they are working there, they're successful, but they feel that they need some specialized space education in addition to their Bachelor of Science education to progress in the professionally. So uh, because of that, uh, uh, we have uh, students with all kinds of backgrounds as shown here. We have active <clears throat> and duty military students as well. Uh, half of our students study part-time and work full-time in the industry. Half of our students are full-time students on campus. And uh, we studying online for the full-time working students. Uh, they study through our distance education network that reaches students anywhere in the world. Now, we also have a community of our alumni, of our graduates of our program. It's again, more than 700 today. I also want to mention uh, just a little bit about uh, this uh, distance education network that I mentioned. When students come to our classes, and they are on campus and online students simultaneously, the same class for students on campus and for the students uh, online. And uh, 
This is a tremendously powerful tool because all lectures are recorded. And after the lecture, you can go to a server, whether you are on campus or online students, it's open to everybody. After that, the lecture is on the server until the end of the semester. That means if you miss something in the lecture, or have difficulties with understanding something, some concepts, you can always go later back to the server and the watch as many times as needed this particular part of the lecture or the entire lecture. Also, sometimes uh, students get engaged in many activities like say our liquid rocket propulsion lab or maybe some sport activities which collide with the schedule of classes. This is not a problem. You simply, if you are full-time students, you simply skip a class. And then later you watch it at your convenience, at your convenient time. Uh, uh, on uh, on the from the uh, pre-recorded for this recorded lecture on the server, for uh, remote students, it's also in the possibility to watch again at the time most convenient because they work full time, and uh, this allows to manage time very efficiently. Again, this is for both for online and on campus students. It's a the distance education network provides a tremendous tool, tremendous capability to efficiently and effectively use your time. So now it's a couple of websites that are very important for you. On the left, there's a, uh, the website of our newsletter. Every six months in the middle of the semester, we publish a newsletter that provides you with the, with the information up, update on the classes offering, when classes offered, and uh, what are, who are the instructors, and all other useful information. So this is uh, the permanent website. URL is given on the left. And you can, uh, whenever the new newsletter is published, it is at the same URL. I expect, actually, within a week, uh, we have some administrative process. So we have a firming up the class schedule for the next academic year. So within a week or two at this URL will be new newsletter with the schedule of classes and the instructors and all that. This newsletter also has a long-term schedule of classes as shown on the right. You see there is a, there is a, some chart with the boxes checked. So the URL is at the bottom of this slide. Again, uh, within a couple of weeks, there will be an updated uh, long-term schedule for three or four years that allows students to plan their studies. Why it is important? Because some classes are offered every semester, required classes. Some classes are offered once a year. Some classes are offered more specialized courses are offered once every two years. So when student comes to our program, you look at this long-term schedule and you can plan the your progress, which classes you want to take. Because we have many more classes that you would take during your graduate studies that is needed for you to get your degree. And because of that, you have to be very judicious in selecting the courses that best meet your educational goals. Now, in order to get a degree, you need to have nine courses. All courses are three units. So total 27 units. There are four required courses on the overall uh, overview of the space systems, the spacecraft system design, then a course in space environment, course in spacecraft propulsion and rocketry, and orbital mechanics. If you had any of such courses in your undergraduate studies, for example, a senior course in spacecraft propulsion or a senior course in the spacecraft system designs, then you can waive this requirement. We will never force you to repeat the coursework that you already had. You waive this requirement, you don't need to take this course and it opens you a window to take an additional technical elective. So in addition to four required courses, you have to take three core elective courses. Basically, our astronautics courses are core electives. So you have to take three such courses. And then two technical electives, which could be from any department. However, overwhelming majority of our students, master students pursuing the degree of Master of Science in Astronautical Engineering, they take these two 
technical electives from the list of our core electives, because this list of core electives is the reason why the students coming to our program. These are specialized courses in space engineering that are taught by the best people uh, from industry and uh, government. Now, Master of Science thesis is optional. Uh, very few students, I would say two or three students every year do this. And the reason is that amount of work to do the thesis is significantly larger than the number of units credit that you would get. Many students rather opt for taking simply technical electives because again, this choice of technical electives is the reason that many students come to our program. It's a very broad exposure. So now it's a nice segue to, to our coursework that is offered today. We are continuously developing and introducing new courses. Uh, it takes uh, time to develop new courses, but we're just doing that. There's some areas of growth. So uh, this list, again, you will get it in the power PDF and uh, it's color coded. There are at the top uh, left, there are courses uh, basically in space systems, then uh, blue coded courses in spacecraft dynamics with the orbital mechanics, space navigation, attitude control, then a cluster of propulsion courses. In addition to regular propulsion, like introductory course, we have a specialized courses in the liquid propulsion, solid propulsion, advanced propulsion, then also space launch vehicle design, physical gas dynamics, there's a couple of courses in the structural uh, structural uh, fields related to spacecraft and structural dynamics and materials. There are courses covering various uh, subsystems like thermal control, power system, say, and others. Uh, also, there is a hands-on course, ground communications for satellite operations, where students uh, communicate, capture information, uh, radio transmissions from a satellite using real antenna on campus and uh, dealing with that. And then uh, there are courses uh, in the, the two areas that are growing. So the first area of growth is uh, relates to safety of space missions and operations. And we have a few courses in this uh, field. Uh, this is the area which is in particular growth right now because a lot of commercial operators are coming to space and a lot of uh, development in the human space flight, including suborbital sub space flight, space tourism, which obviously brings a lot of safety issues. Another area, we already developed a cluster of courses in the human space flight. And the, the reason that we're advancing in this field, again, there's a growth in the humans flights, including suborbital, sub but also uh, we, we brought on faculty a few years ago, a very distinguished uh, faculty member who was a NASA astronaut, spent uh, 100 days in, on the International Space Station and then worked at SpaceX building their human space capsule. So he's building up this program coursework here on uh, campus for our students. Now, um, getting uh, close, uh, closer to the end of these short presentations. So in order to get to the program, you have to have a Bachelor of Science degree in engineering or science. You don't need, again, an aerospace degree, any area of science and engineering, we will take you from there. Uh, your cumulative grade point average is 3.2. If it is a lower, you still can apply. We there are, some, there are some cases that we will bring students uh, still in on a conditional basis. Uh, then the uh, GREs usually were required. Now with COVID, they were waived, but most likely we will return GREs will be required and the two letters of recommendations. Everything else, um, Everything else, all these uh, deadlines, uh, Luis much better is qualified to update you on that. Now, Admission process takes significant time, as you know, it's months, plural. If your GPA is higher than 3.2 and you are in engineering or science, you can start studies most likely as a so-called limited student. Uh, you, you, need, uh, you can start studies without being formally admitted. You 
take courses while your application is being considered and processed. And later, when you are admitted, this uh, course that you, courses that you took as a limited student would be credited towards your degree. So this is simply a way for the students with the GPA higher than 3.2 to get to, into the, start taking courses quickly while the, the application is being considered. Now, typical questions. Full-time students typically finish the program in three semesters, one and a half years. However, we're in Los Angeles, there are many places for internships. And many students during the summers and some during semesters apply for internships and they many get internships. And some of them after the summer of internship uh, like it very much there and the company values them they increase their hours during the semester that they spend there and they're partially paid obviously. So when this happens, a student typically reduces course load. And because of that, the studies may then getting a degree for a full-time student may be extended to four, even five semesters. Again, this is a common story. A lot of our students get internships at SpaceX. It's a company growing uh, for the last, um, 20 years. Part-time students typically take one or sometimes two courses per semester. So it takes them for the online students to take uh, three or four years of studies. Course sequence. Do you have to take required courses before electives? No. Most of our courses, they are self-contained. They uh, You can st start taking them immediately, except if you have, for example, liquid rocket propulsion, you need to take the first introductory course in propulsion, then you can uh, proceed to the uh, liquid propulsion course. Orbital mechanics two requires orbital mechanics one. So, but uh, courses that introducing certain subfields do not require uh, any uh, sequence. Required courses can be waived. We will never ask you to repeat your coursework from undergraduate years. Uh, technical electives from other departments. Absolutely, we allow you to take whatever you want that will advance your educational objectives. We're here simply as a faculty, as an advisor, I'm here just to help you to make this decision and the choose. But again, as I have said, most of the students overwhelmingly take our astronautics courses uh, for core electives and uh, technical electives, because this is the reason that they're coming to the program. And now uh, attending classes on campus by distance students, it's always welcome whenever a distance student uh, happens to be in Los Angeles on business, for instance, very often they come and introduce themselves to the instructor, attend courses um, uh, live, classes live. And our on-campus students sometimes skip lectures because of some other more interesting and important things to do. And then again, because of distance education network, they go to the server and watch the lecture at a convenient time. Now, the difference between programs in astronautical and aerospace engineering, it's a long story. It's, I would refer you to a publication, this article in ACTA Astronautica in 2014. But what, uh, just very briefly, space engineering, or always it's historically uh, second rate citizens in aerospace departments because the departments historically were established to serve aeronautical engineering aviation industry. So because of that, you know, we thought that it's important to have a separate department that specifically focuses on astronautical engineering, on space engineering, and the program grows in the highly competitive environment is a clear indication that we provide a valuable degree, degree for industry as indicated by engineers who already work at Boeing's and, and JPL, Lockheed Martin, and they come to us to get a master of science degree in astronautical degree in engineering. And they have a choice to go to basically any university the company would support them. So this is indication that we provide something of value. And finally, uh, the links, uh, Luis, uh, 
is in charge, so he's on the call. He's in charge of our student services, student affairs, so he's the, the most knowledgeable person. Also, Ms. Del Coasson is um, our business manager of the department. She's also uh, supports student affairs. So I'm a program director and faculty advisor. Uh, now, Ray, who moderates this meeting, is next to these green aliens on the photo. So he's also a spaceman. Uh, in spite, uh, you may not have known that. And uh, finally, we had all kinds of graduates and uh, even this guy in a, in a helmet. All right, this is all on my side. Thank you, Dr. Gretman. That was a great presentation. Um, we will go now ahead and move on forward to our student panelists section of this um, event for today. Dr. Grimman, if you don't mind stop sharing, we can go ahead and introduce our- Sure, absolutely. Now I need to find where, how to stop sharing. Yeah, stop sharing. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was a lot of great info. I hope that answered a lot of the questions that were sent to us earlier in the last couple of weeks. Um, so just kind of getting started, my name is Luis Savayos. I'm the student affairs director here at the astronautical engineering department. I oversee all the programs here. So we have PhD programs, two master's program, and obviously an undergrad bachelor's program. Um, I wanna welcome two of our current um, ASTE master's students who are also really involved with our Viterbi Graduate Student Association as they're both representatives for our department. Um, so I wanna go ahead and welcome Akshita and Prashant. Um, if you all wanna just unmute yourself and share a few words and kind of, we'll go ahead and get started after that with the questions. Yeah, I could I, I could start. Uh, hey guys, my name is Prashant Prasad. I'm in the Masters of Astronautics program. This is my final semester here at USC. I'll be graduating in May, um, this May. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm part of Liquid Propulsion Laboratories here. I am was I am part. Uh, I am one of the flight vehicle engineers. Also, I was the previous J and J responsible engineer, which was a and was like a pair of engines that were fired off a couple of times throughout the years and now it's finally retired. I'm also a representative of a senator, representative senator for the astronautics department and VGSA, Viterbi Graduate Student Association, which is one of the largest student run organizations on campus, you know, because we're Viterbi. So we're in charge of all the Viterbi graduate students and we take care of all of student concerns and needs and we host events uh, for the students here at USC for the graduate Viterbi students. Thank you, Prashant. Hi, everyone. My name is Akshita Swaminathan, and I firstly want to welcome all of you to the Trojan family. Uh, I did my bachelor's back home in India, and it was in aerospace engineering. Right now, I'm doing my master's in astronautical engineering. It's my second semester here. Um, I've been loving LA. It's been a great time. Uh, and the best part is that I'm able to attend classes in person and uh, the experience has been great. Uh, I'm also a part of the VGSA where I'm the department senator and I'm also a part of the uh, e-board at USC AIAA. Thank you so much. Um, so now we'll go ahead and get started with the main question, right? We have 14 attendees here and obviously the folks that will be watching the recording. The main question is, why did you two choose USC? What was it that the academics brought to you of interest or some of your experience, obviously, at this point? What, what made you want to come here to USC? Uh, I think I wanted to come to USC just as uh, Professor Gremman has said, it's a hub of all the space industries here. Um, we're like right at the center. Like if you go 20 miles west of camp, like, you know, like 20, 20 25 miles west of campus, you hit, you'll hit all the aerospace companies. All my uh, friends and former classmates, they're, uh, all the alumni, they all work in El Segundo, Redondo Beach, uh, Steel Beach, all those locations. It's an amazing location to work in the airspace field here at uh, LA. And the school and the program itself is very special. It's uh, one of the most unique programs in the world, I would like to say. And you know, I think it's factually speaking. So coming here was like, it was just essentially a no-brainer. For me, what caught uh, my eye was the 
uh, program that is offered at USC, uh, like Prashant and Professor Grandman said, it is one of a kind. Astronautical engineering is not offered in a lot of universities. And you have a lot of freedom to choose subjects. Like in if you choose a subject and you can take a few classes before you decide whether or not to take it. So that is what is the best part of the program. And also the location is a very prime uh, uh, characteristic that made me decide to go to USC. It is the uh, aerospace hub. So I, it was definitely my first choice. Nice. So kind of sticking with that career job interest, how has this program itself kind of being part of different groups have helped you kind of prepare for that next step going into the professional world? Or what was your approach to selecting your courses to kind of helping you get to that next step? Obviously, we have a wide range of courses. What was your kind of specialty of going about those topics and, you know, kind of moving forward? Yeah, so I, my undergrad is actually in mechanical engineering. So my, my undergrad school, which I went to Sacramento State, which is up north, um, the capital of California, it has essentially no airspace program whatsoever. So I came from a, uh, I came from a background that had no airspace, uh, airspace at all, or in that sense, I had no um, astronautics. So I wanted to focus more on propulsion engineering side of it. Like that's one of the few concentrations here at, in the astronautics department. And so I picked classes towards that and uh, doing classes here, which has a lot of concentration in like um, propulsion and really helped me out in my uh, career field, which I hopefully will work in propulsion. Nice. For me, uh, it is a little difficult because I'm an international student. And um, as it is known that in the US, it is difficult for an international student to get uh, jobs in the uh, core aerospace field because of the ITAR regulations. Uh, but despite that, there are a lot of uh, research opportunities offered at our university as well as other universities. And you can get in touch with uh, uh, JPL who have research fellowships. So there are opportunities even for international students, but you have to fight hard for that. Thank you. Thank you. So kind of now that we have a little bit of the intro about both of you and your kind of experience of why you come to USC and the aspiration kind of how do you get involved now that you've been here a few semesters or a few years and what what were the best practices that you used to you know succeed in the academics and want to use some of these theories that you use in the class into these labs kind of for example the liquid propulsion lab what, what were your best practices to just getting involved with the Viterbi community I think the best practice is to um um what's it called step out of your comfort zone and like get involved with like uh clubs and organizations talk to professors talk to students uh make friends because at the end of the day no no one single person can essentially build a whole rocket from beginning to scratch in a in a in a, a short amount of time as opposed to like a team of um engineers i know that from hand because you need there's a lot of sub disciplinaries that um, goes into rocketry avionics um safety systems engineering you know propulsion structures everything so like definitely that's going to help you out in the career field because um people want engineers to not I mean not also be knowledgeable in that subject but to also be able to communicate well and talk to their peers at any given time just because you'll be working alongside them so like my advice is just like you know step out join an organization be active in that organization because you can join it and like not be active all whatsoever but that doesn't really work at usc uh because they only pick students who are going to be active and like put in the effort nice so uh, like Prashant said, it is very important to, you know, know your spheres. Uh, but I also feel that, you know, um, networking is very, very important. Uh, it is the it is the key to surviving here. You have to get in touch with your professors, alumni, what they are doing and how they are working in their industry right now, if they have already graduated. And you get to learn a lot from their experiences. And based on that, you have to uh, go ahead and make your decisions very wisely. And like uh, 
uh, Dr. Grantman said that you have to plan ahead and very judiciously so that you don't make any mistakes in the middle of a semester after uh, passing certain deadlines. Like, okay, I, I, I have passed the uh, drop or add deadline to any of my courses. Don't do that in the middle of the semester. Plan it ahead and ask your seniors, ask a lot of your um, professors, get in touch with them before you join the university. Do a lot of homework before you get into the program. Awesome, awesome. So thank you both for sharing a lot about your experience. Obviously, with, with time's sake, we've got a few minutes. We want to have a few of the Q&A kind of answer for the for the students that are attending here. Um, there's two questions here, one specifically for both of you. Do you know what your plans are after graduation? Um, I know, actually, that you could kind of speak on your international side with OPT and your experience, and obviously, Prashan, how you kind of plan to go forward after this semester. Yeah, so I mean, I plan to work in the aerospace field, like hopefully in the Redondo Beach area or um, somewhere in that area. Also, um, through uh, one of my alumni friends, alumnus friends, he is volunteering with uh, Systems Coalition, which is like a um, STEM organization that helps kids in the inner city area, like, you know, learn about STEMs, like six to like 13 year old kids. So just go, just help with that. Hopefully, you know, I'll be in this area. Um, also volunteer with the kids and also volunteer with the USC, combine them together because that's what my organization is doing right now. We're trying to bring in this like major groups of, um, essentially we're trying to bring in future engineers and future astronauts and future, you know, aerospace engineers at USC at a very early age. And then um, one of the other questions were, um, what's the process of getting research in, uh, assistance ships slash do they help pay for school? I'm not too familiar with that question. Is this, um, getting a research in, uh, internship, you would have to talk to the professors themselves. I believe they do take in mostly PhD candidates, but since our program is very small, there they are capabilities of, um, of you uh, doing the research uh, internship yourself, but you, you have to really go out there and look for the, um, the opportunities yourself. Do they pay for school? I would have to talk to them. Uh, I wouldn't know that, but there are government, uh, graduate student government funding that do help pay for uh, internships if they're unpaid. Uh, you have to apply for those. Getting RA is difficult. RA. Uh, okay, uh, let me step in for 30 seconds. Uh, the you, school determines who can or cannot apply for the formal RA ships and TA ships. At USC, as in all leading research universities, only this Assistant ships are reserved for PhD students, for doctoral students. However, hourly involvement and being paid hourly wages is very, very common for our master students. And one of the places we have a space engineering research center, which is uh, partially owned by our department and led by our professor, Professor Barnhart of Western Nordics. So they uh, in, involve uh, probably more than a dozen of the master students on uh, that uh, on the, with that arrangement. So I wanted to actually to share about her post graduation um, plans and stuff like that. So after I complete my master's, which I'm planning to do in May 23, uh, would be to. Uh, I'll be applying for OPT and looking for a job as well as I'll be exploring my PhD options uh, at, at USC as well as other universities. Thank you, yeah. So how we mentioned pretty much master students in our program, they're self-funded. Um, there might be a few scholarships, but not from within the department. If a student does kind of want those fellowship assistantship, you would have to officially apply for our PhD program. And obviously that's a whole separate conversation, but. And many students uh, get internships. And uh, as I said, this is a common story when they start to get um, there and uh, get heavily involved more than they expected in the beginning. Again, they're being paid partially and sometimes they have to reduce even the course load because of that. So this is a very, very common, and we're in the right place. And again, the Jet, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Aerospace Corporation, Boeing, uh, Raytheon, and uh, SpaceX in particular attracted. There's a tons of our alumni uh, work there. 
Um, Prashant and Akshita, I don't know if you both would mind sharing your contact info if any of the attendees would want to reach out personally and just kind of touch base with you all since, you know, you both are representatives for our Viterbi Graduate Student Association. Maybe some of these folks would want to be interested in joining the program that will be on campus. And obviously for our DEN students that just want insight in course selection or any questions, they can obviously reach out to you if you don't mind. Um, as also me being the academic advisor, feel free to reach out to me and I can always connect you with the proper folks and just get you to the right direction. We give you a lot of good information. So if you have any follow-up questions, please feel free to contact me through email. I also put my, my details there where I have an appointment link. So feel free to set up an appointment if you'd like to want to chat with me and kind of get that going for a course plan. As we mentioned, you can make your own course plan, but if you want more insight in our courses and kind of how to navigate the space, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I guess at this time, that would conclude our event for today. Um, thank you, Dr. Gruntman. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Prashant and Akshita for helping us out. And please let us know if there's any questions. Thank you all for um, both for participating in this webinar. Um, at this point, uh, we, we will consider this finished and uh, I wish you all the best for the rest of today. Thank you very much.